You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Benazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again to gather around the old program called The Option Block, your bi-weekly source for all things options related. My name is Mark Longo, coming to you from the Options Insider HQ here in a little bit more tropical than normal. <laughs> Chicago, Illinois, the options capital of the known, indeed the listed world. Maybe OTC Mecca is elsewhere, but uh, the listed options world, you're still in the heart of it here in good old Chicago. And of course, speaking of the heart of it, we are the heart of quite a content offering on the option side of the fence, whether you want your content in written form or maybe breaking down some news, some education, some analysis. We got it all for you over there at theoptionsinsider.com. And of course, while you're there, while you're reading, while you're getting your fix of all things options, Click on that Insider Radio Network tab, and your journey has begun, listeners. You're off to the races for all of our nine years now of content for you guys to peruse at your leisure and, indeed, at your convenience. And to add to that convenience factor, it's available in all the major app stores, or, or excuse me, all the major outlets, iTunes and Stitcher and all that fun stuff. And, of course, also the app stores, iOS, Google Play, etc. So no matter how you like to consume your content, maybe you're hardcore, you like to grab an RSS feed, maybe you're a little bit on the lazier side, you just want to sit back and relax, have our content just spoon-fed, shoveled right to you. Either way, we don't judge. Just get the program, download it, stream it, however you like to get it via your platform of choice. And of course, while you're doing it, send those questions, send those comments, send those tweets, send those emails, those Facebook questions. We love to hear from you guys. And joining me on the old program today, starting off, let's go... I can say an order of proximity, but I'm not sure where, where he's hanging his hat today. So we'll just guess that Mark's downtown, and we'll go to the Greasy Meatball first. Mr. Greasy Meatball, a.k.a. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com, as well as Carmen Line Capital. Mr. Greasy Meatball, welcome back to the program. How are things in your neck of the woods today? Wherever that may be, out in the hinterlands, out downtown, wherever the global capital is hanging his head today. Hi, things are great. Things are lovely here. It's, uh, it's a nice cold, but, uh, but great day. Can't can't go wrong in Chicago. That's what I say. That's what you say, huh? That's your family motto. You can't go mm -hmm. wrong in Chicago. Mark Sebastian. I like it. Yes. <laughs> All right. And also joining us, also a man who's proud of his area, but a little bit farther out. He is known far and wide through the hinterlands of St. Charles, Illinois. You know him, you love him, as Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the big show, sir. Love it out here in my hamlet. It is a wonderful place. It is a Hamlet, and you guys, to celebrate that, also perform Hamlet on a regular basis out there, I believe. The St. Charles Shakespeare Theater, a very unheralded uh, mecca for the arts out there in the hinterlands of Chicago. All right, with the team assembled, we're going to dive right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where we break down what's moving, what's shaking, what's rocking, what's rolling on the old street today. It was an interesting one. If you just kind of came and checked out the closing numbers, doesn't really show a heck of a lot really going on, only pretty much unched, almost literally, on the S&P, but that kind of belies a little bit more activity 
that was going on intraday. We had a nice little range, about a 27 handle odd range out there in the S&P. So it got down, down about as low as about 1920, as high as about 1947 or so. And finishing the day to the upside, but a little bit off those lofty highs right around 19. 19- 40 or so. So a little bit of intraday action, but closing the day pretty much almost literally unched on the day, pretty much all the major indices with the exception of the NASDAQ, which is up slightly, all the major indices pretty much closing literally unched on the day. And with all that back and forth signifying nothing at the end of the day, we see uh, VIX Cash taking yet another inhale, breaking through to the south side, breaking through the 20 handle, the much much watched 20 handle out there, uh, getting as low as about, oh, about 1960 or so intraday, closing or ending the day, I should say, right around 1990, 1988 or so, right in that range. So breaking through the 20 handle, we'll see if that remains or if there's a little bit more vol to come. Of course, we have some more earnings and we have some more events later this week, which could help to propel us to the north. Uh, let's start in that neck of the woods. Mark, you haven't been on the old OB program in a while, so we'll start with you. What caught your eye in today's sea of activity, sir? You know, it's impressive, but uh, they managed to settle VIX at 20 on the nose today. Pretty impressive. It, well, it's still, still flapping around that, a little bit. Has that ever happened before, an even number like that? I'm trying to think about the last time we saw an even number. Yeah, I think it's going to hit 20. On, my guess is they managed to settle it at 20. That, that's, that's my prediction here, folks. And, uh, but, you know, when I Google uh, had earnings after the bell and uh, – you know, we had, I had philosophized, hey, I wonder if uh, they baked in Google earnings already because of how marvelous Facebook did and yada, yada, yada. Nope. Google is up $50 right now. And uh, if it opens up here, it's going to be the most valuable company in the world, not Apple anymore. There you go, Uncle Mike. A shot across the bow at your beloved fruit company, which you are now slowly, incrementally getting back into uh, in addition to, we'll get to the, the Google earnings in a minute. We'll parse all that fun stuff out. But in addition to all that fun stuff, what else caught your eye in today's activity, sir? Well, first off, my Apple indicator just made me want to buy a couple, a few more thousand shares because whenever Sebastian says anything negative about Apple while well, I'm starting to get into it, it's pretty much a bullish sign. So ah. that, that's, that's how history is held anyway. So. All right. So with that, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I, I don't know if I quite have the courage to do it because I'm not quite as bullish on Apple as I once was, though. So I don't know. I'll have to analyze that one at a later time. But you know, a couple of things that caught my eye today, from what it looks like, based on the news that came out about the Fed today, they're probably not going to raise rates a lot of times this year. And it might only be two times. Uh, but with that, uh, TLT has did not get a lot of movement during the day. However, one thing that did catch my eye is the shiny stuff. Uh, gold had another up day on the day with GLD up approximately 1%. Uh, so I, overall, it's kind of just to add to what you had said, Mark, there really wasn't a lot of um, start to finish news, but there was a lot of things that happened in between. Of course, oil's down $2, so what else is new there? But maybe it'll be up another four dollars the next day. Uh, oil is definitely something to watch intraday. And if you're if you're mm-hmm. bored and you need to get your blood pressure up, then I would suggest day trading oil. Uh, it's a very exciting thing to do. Yeah, I, you know, Mike. To to your point, I think oil seems to have found a little bit of a range here. Uh, it's moving around still, but it's it. You know, I, I think people are going to be willing to somewhat ignore oil's movement until it cracks below uh kind of some old lows then maybe people get worried uh that that's something that could affect things but until then uh who knows uh who knows well you know the other thing that caught my eye today too is just not necessarily so much today although it is up almost two percent on the day is walmart uh, throughout everything that we have gone through so far this year, uh, the market being down approximately uh, five, five and a half percent, something along those lines with the S&P, Walmart in and of itself uh, is actually up over 10 percent on the year. So something to be said about that. Uh, granted, it had a miserable year last year, but when money shifts, there's uh, there, there, there's some guy I'm not even going to mention his name but there is a bull market out there somewhere but walmart has been the bull market in bigger stocks thus far this year speaking of big stocks and uh, breaking out we see as mark alluded to good old alphabet i'm still still getting acclimated to that good old alphabet 
reporting here after the bell. This is the name. They had a decent day. They closed up about 1% or a little over seven handles, closing almost exactly right around the seven half, 750 handle there. And they were pricing in right about a 50, 50 bucks or so in that straddle. So closing in on about 7%, about six and a half, seven percent or so in that range. And so far we're seeing pretty much exactly that in the after hours. It was up about 48 bucks or about 6.4%. Uh, just a little bit coming off a little bit now, only up about 43 now. So about 5.7% in the after hours, hovering around the 795 handle. But it seems like all that premium, all that juice uh, going in there uh, seems like, at least so far, at least if the move can hold up, it seems like it will be rewarded. Looking at the day out there from an overall uh, narrative uh, perspective, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the most active uh, of, uh, of days, and it wasn't like there was a predominance of activity. Like we saw in Amazon, there was a predominance of, of crazy upside call activity, even in the near term. Uh, we saw you know, a decent amount of volume, but nothing as... Uh, as shall we say one-sided and ultimately dangerous as we saw in the Amazon land where people were getting almost Apple-esque, I dare say, in their love for upside. I believe the 700s and other crazy strikes were just trading uh, out of control there. I don't think we saw as much madness out there, but Mark, was was Goog lighting it up in the old pit chat today as well? You know, we were we were looking at it, and a lot of people were kind of thinking that the move was baked in, so they wanted... You know, generally people were actually looking at myself included from kind of a bearish perspective, or maybe this is one of those times where, uh, you know, some sort of time spread or premium sell made might have worked. But the issue with Google options, and this is maybe why they didn't trade that much, is that the at the money, the at the spread on the at the money straddle was four bucks wide. That's uh, that's going to stop you from uh, your average retail trader from jumping in. I mean, most retailers aren't buying. $52 straddles anyway, but uh, in particular, uh, Google was uh, especially maybe uh, tough to get into. Yeah, we're getting to that point again. You're right. The spreads are, are certainly an issue in and of themselves. But, you know, with Apple, not actually not so much Apple, but with, you know, Google and Amazon last week and some of the other big names we were talking about, it does kind of make me think back again. That I wish the minis experiment had worked. I wish they had found a way. I wish the industry had stepped up and decided not to try to rip people off with the fees. I wish uh, the market makers had actually tried to make markets in these things because this is this would be a perfect time where I think the entire industry would be doing pretty well. Uh, well from Mark, overall... you know, Go ahead. One of the issues that you have is that, well, everybody said, oh, yeah, no, retail people should love this, and then they charged full fees on all of it. Well, that's what I'm saying. The industry dropped the ball completely. You know, they, they tried to rip them the, off. Well, the industry just basically said, oh, we're we're trying to see if you're dumb enough to trade these, and if you are – then we will make sure that you pay for trying to trade it. And the only one that had any volume was Apple, then Apple reverse split. And, uh, yeah, this has just been – that it was a total – it was the exchanges, the industry. Nobody wanted to discount those things, and they were just a ginormous – F you to the general public. Yeah, that's why I say it, 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 the industry collectively dropped the ball there because everyone screwed up. I mean, you hear and you hear the blame passed everywhere. You know, the exchanges will pass it along uh, to OCC that they charged full clearing fees for it. So the exchange would charge their full fees, and then the brokers would charge their for commissions. And then for whatever reason, maybe all of the above, the market makers didn't want to touch these things, so the spreads were wide. So the product ended up becoming an IQ test more than a product. If you touch these things, you were pretty much deemed to be not that savvy of a trader because you can get whatever else you wanted done in the big price products for lower commissions, lower fees, and more importantly, tighter spreads. Uh, so yeah, that this is the time of year where a product like that would have really resonated with a lot of people. And unfortunately, everyone kind of collectively screwed the pooch on that one. And now we don't have them anymore. Uh, speaking of the industry and the failures therein, this month, or I should say last month, was not one of them. After a year, 2015, where Options volume a little bit lackluster, shall we say, down about nearly 4% or so uh, on the year last year. We saw a bit of a rebound in January, probably not surprising to all of you. We pretty much came out of the gates. I think strong is, is underselling it a little bit, came out of the gates, tumultuous, rip-roaring, rocking, call it what you will. Every other day, a gut punch from China, from the Middle East, North Korea got in there. Don't forget the H-bomb threat earlier there in the year. Then, of course, the Fed. It was kind of just one thing after another for the entire month. And no surprise, that contributed to a decent pop in volume. Jan 2016 
was about uh, 372 million contracts. That's up 4% from January of last year, 2015. Uh, the third, ironically, only the third highest uh, January on record. You'd think that that would maybe be taking the lead position, uh, but uh, apparently not this uh, past year. So January, hopefully, perhaps setting the tone. Of course, a few people out there probably saying to themselves they would trade a little bit less volatile markets for a little bit less volume out there perhaps as well. So it kind of depends where you sit out there as well. And of course, speaking of, uh, since we're talking volume and exchanges and all that fun stuff, it was announced yet today, yet again, finally, after much back and forth. And we've said many times on this show over the last couple of years, kind of talking about the just ridiculous explosion in the number of exchanges out there and how many is too many. And we've been at the Baker's Dozen for a little while now, since November of last year when BATS launched Edge X Options, I believe they're calling it their second exchange. Well, ISC has been threatening to launch a third for about a year and a half. It finally, finally, after a year and a half, got approval for that third one. It will be ISE Mercury, and it will launch later this month, February 16th. So if you were saying to yourself, you know, 13... 13 doesn't do it for me. I need 14 exchanges to really get my options trading needs satiated. Well, there you go. They have listened to you, and we will be at a whopping 14. So two more than November of last year, if you're paying attention at this. So just in a couple of months, uh, just a ridiculous increase. Uh, Mark, Mr. Uncle Mike, anything to say on that or perhaps the overall numbers from last year? Oh, thank God. We needed another exchange. Yeah. Oh, my don't goodness. They, don't they have a rule that for every new exchange added, they need to get rid of one market maker to uh, widen out markets and reduce liquidity? <laughs> that seems to be how it's working out. I'm, I'm not sure if that was the grand plan, but if it was, Bally it's such them. a. I mean, this is a complete you-know-what show, and it's insulting to the general public that this 14th, really 13th, 12th, 11th, 10th, 9th, all the way down to about 7th, exchanges needed i mean there hasn't been an exchange with a creative solution to anything since maybe box and nasdaq and and all the rest have just been succubuses succubuses (laughs) getting getting into the realm of mythology i like it good stuff good stuff well let's let's get to a a happier i think i think a headline you'll certainly may like a little bit more mark and something kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier you'll remember on january i talked about coming back from a a, a briefing with the SIBO, and i was kind of on them a little bit about hey when are you going to add dailies or something to that effect uh, to their schedule because they're getting so much volume even in the last couple of days of these weeklies and as not surprisingly they kind of pushed back on the concept of a daily uh, because a lot of people think it's too too much connotation to gambling but they were surprisingly open to the idea of additional weeklies uh, which surprised me because they've pretty much been reticent on a lot of that stuff for the beginning but it doesn't take a genius to realize that's where the action is and you know if you start adding more weeklies to the mix listeners it it effectively becomes dailies at that point every given week you're going to have uh, something popping off something expiring while the newest addition perhaps the the crack in the dam that will spread more weeklies far and wide is the new uh, SPX Wednesday weeklies, as they're calling them, which will be expiring on Wednesday, as the name implies. So now if you're paying attention, you're starting to get, you don't have the full week yet, but you're getting a couple of days in there, and it probably won't be long before if either it's SIBO or someone else uh, adds more to the mix. Obviously, this has a particular cachet with SIBO uh, because they already have some other products, you know, expiring and settling on that Wednesday kind of uh, time frame. So this kind of makes sense for that SPX community, whether it resonates by and large with, let's say, the retail populace who are out there writing Apple puts to add the weeklies and Wednesdays. So I don't know, but I'm guessing this is just the beginning of more weeklies and soon to effectively be dailies in the uh, months to, and perhaps by the end of this year to come. Mr. Seabass, what's your take on the on the Wednesday weeklies? You know, I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, I think they picked Wednesday to uh, maybe help some VIX traders that were uh, interested in in having some exposure to the the open uh, of that day uh, relative to some positions. I, I'm kind of interested in kind of how that may arbitrate, you know, the, what kind of arbitrage and trading opportunities it creates relative to, you know, other, other products like VIX, obviously. And uh, it makes total sense. I welcome it and I'm happy about it. Go, go SPX. Let's have more of this. Yeah, I think this is the trend. And you're right. It makes sense. I mean, a lot of people were in there using these products to trade in or on or hedge on or 
in the case of our show, right into us freaking out about settlements. <laughs> so uh, all they were really focusing on was that day anyway. So why, why have it go out another day? You know, this makes total sense. Uh, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how all this uh, shakes out in the wash. But I'd imagine this one will probably be a hit, given just the other weeklies they've launched already. And then other exchanges will follow suit. And listeners, by, uh, by process of osmosis, you'll be getting close to effectively those dailies that a lot of you have been asking about for some time now. All right, and that's going to do it for you old trading block. Now we're going to keep on rolling right on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Odd Block. Like that little funky theme implies, this is the portion of the show where we take a little bit of a, a skew view into the world of options attempt to pick out some of the more interesting, weirder, more bizarre, head-scratching, sometimes just downright, what the heck are they doing kind of trades that are lighting it up in the options market today. If you want more detail on these or a bunch of others, we don't have time to get to on the old show. Again, the mothership, the place you should go, theoptionsinsider.com. We got it all broken down for you there in a lot more detail, as well as perhaps there's a ticker you're looking at these days. You want to see if we talked about it in the past? Well, then type it into the old search box. See what you find. Chances are we've hit on it in some way, shape, or form in all the different unusual activity we profiled here all right let's kick things off a name we haven't talked about in a while on the old odd block this is kroger company ticker symbol kr closing today right around 40 bucks even up about a buck 30 or about three and a half percent on the day this is the name that does about oh about 6500 contracts a day doing a fair sight more than that doing nearly 36,000 today about 12 to 1 calls over puts and that'll tell you pretty much where we drew our eye here on uh, on the old Kroger and in particular it was out in the March expiration cycle where we saw all this call love picking up it started off with with small size 650 of the March 42 halves going up paper buying for 60 cents uh, that went up on the Amex as the day went on. A lot more size went up on that strike as well as another one to the tune of about 8400 on the March 42 halves, paper buy-in for uh, subsequent prices, all the way up to about $0.75. Cents. So they paid up for, for some of these. They went out $0.50 cents at $0.60. Cents. And then we saw the March 37 halves trading as well, about 8,000 times there as well. And what's interesting about this and what made us perhaps at first blush think that this could perhaps be closing is we see uh, size open interest uh, on both of these strikes, about 10,000 on the March 42 halves and nearly 10,000 on the March 37 halves. So this could be a couple of interesting nuggets, but on the uh, on the 42 halves, it definitely looked like it was probably buy-in to close. Mr. Mr. Greasy Meatball, I know this one caught your attention earlier in the day. I know you love yourself some retail chains. <laughs> What's your take on this one? Not just the 42 halves. About the 37 halves. Think they're closing out a stupid or a vertical? What, what was your take on this one? I, you know, not 100% certain. I definitely closed in the 42 and a halves. I uh, was not sure about the 37 and a halves, but uh, I do know that uh, it, it was and it was some sort of, uh, you know, I think it was a uh, some sort of, of roll trade based on based on what I saw. And uh, some of the follow-up, but it absolutely, based on the amount of activity, we'll know tomorrow. My guess is is that it was a more of a roll than it was a uh, than it was a uh, a straight up close. But but who knows? Yeah, I mean, there's size OI, so it could be a straight up close, but you know that would be kind of a it'd be weird uh, to uh, to get that done. But it did look they were chasing at least the 42 half legs. That does have the air of closing about it we'll take a little bit deeper dive perhaps into the 37 37s listeners let you know what you think or let us know what you guys think we'd love to hear uh, from you guys on this stuff as well it's not all just us dictating the fun it's also you guys writing it. it's a bit of a conversation a dialogue uh let's see moving on to another thing. speaking of dialogue a name that tends to facilitate that these days for a lot of you guys out there as well is of course twitter ticker symbol twtr closing today just to tick off 18 bucks, 17.91, and it's up about a buck or 11, or about six and a half percent 
on the day today. So the name that does decent volume, about 100K a day going up in options contracts. Doing over 2X that today, doing about 228,000 contracts out there in Twitter land. So they're lighting it up on just the various back and forth in the market, as well as some other news. Of course, there are some perhaps rumors of good old Twitter perhaps being in play yet again. It'd be an intriguing name uh, to take over for all the issues they have going on there with their with their board and their CEO and their, the fact that they still don't really make any money to any appreciable degree. A lot of other things to get into. We won't get into that. Instead, we'll get into the paper we actually saw out here today and kind of a, a bit of a narrative theme, a narrative throughput for the rest of the odd block listeners. It's like bullish risk reversals were kind of uh, the order of the day and what caught our eye out here in Twitter was the Feb. It was in the weeklies. Uh, expiring on the 12th there, the Feb weekly 1518 bullish risk reversal going up. Started catching our eye about a thousand times for a buck 23, selling the put, obviously buying the call. That went up in two blocks over there on the aforementioned SIBO uh, marked spread as the day went on. About, oh, about three, 3,600 of the puts and about 2,600 of the calls going up. Worth mentioning, there's about 3,000 contracts opening on those weekly Feb 15 puts as well. So there could be a little bit at play there, but it seems like someone perhaps all there and uh, looking to spec, a pretty near-term spec as well, that these rumors are going to become pretty hard fact out there in Twitter land uh, pretty soon. Also worth noting for us, at least, the calls lifting, actually going through uh, the offer, puts charging through the bid, so pretty much a good sign that someone wanted to get something done and get it done in a bit of a hurry. Also an interesting, an interesting bit of context whenever we're looking at UA out here. Mr. Greasy Meeple, I haven't talked about Twitter on the old program in a while. This one kind of fascinating. The old bullish risk reversal seems to be playing into all those takeover rumors, no? Scott, there was volume everywhere in Twitter. I mean, the Fab 18 and a half expiring this week traded 17,000 contracts almost, another 8,000 on the 17 and, and 18s, uh, not as much put, almost all bullish uh, bullish leans. I mean, the Feb 12 20s traded 7,000 times. There was, there was bullish in the regular Feb at the 20 strike, you name it, all the way out to Feb. Now, I'm not sure they're going to get straight bought, but uh, certainly some, some people really liked what they saw, and it uh, it, it clearly points toward uh toward some of you know somebody liking what they see uh the stock was probably a little oversold anyway so that's uh that's my best bet seems like a lot of people's best bet today is uh twitter gonna be popping sometime in the near future we'll keep an eye on this one listeners shouldn't be too hard to divine in the pretty these are all weekly trades so we're not talking six months or a year from now so people if they are indeed buying into these rumors they think it's happening pretty soon. Let us know what you think on that one as you pile on into our final name of the day. Uh, this is PVH Corp. Our ticker symbol, appropriately enough, PVH. Closing today, $73.17 off about 20-odd cents or so. If you're not familiar with that name, uh, this is the brand portfolio. Maybe you may be familiar with some of the brands they have in their portfolio. Calvin Klein, Calvin Klein excuse me, Tommy Hilfiger, et cetera, et cetera. Mr. Sebastian's favorite, Izod. I know he likes a nice little nice little alligator or two in his wardrobe. And this is the name that does about 700 or so contracts a day. Doing nearly 9,000 today. So pretty, pretty active day. And I said there was a bit of a throughput here for the rest of our activity. And it once again is ye old bullish risk reversal rearing its ugly head here. Or perhaps a beautiful head, depending on how you look at this one. Uh, this was what caught our eye was the March 65. 65, excuse me, 65. 75 risk reversal going up about 4,000 times, excuse me, 4,001 on the put side and about 4,300 on the call side. Looks like initial kind going up two blocks over there on the Amex. Once again, Lipton offers on the calls and pretty much uh, blasting out there on the old puts. No OI to speak of, so unlike our other names there, uh, no OI muddling the waters. This one appears to be what it is on the surface, opening on the 65 puts and on the 75 calls. Specking for a nice near-term bounce here. Don't see any stock going up with this one. And looking at a nice little chart here of good old PVH, our friends here are looking back fondly at a loftier time just not that long ago, 
back in late summer of last year, August August 31st, actually, it was trading right around 120. So if it were to get anywhere close to those levels again, and even back end of November, it was trading 92. So if it gets anywhere close to those levels, this risk reversal will be sitting pretty. Our friend here thinking to bounce ahoy here in good old PVH. Mr. Mr. Greasy Meatball, take us home here with yet another bullish risk reversal, this time in good old PVH. And PVH, well, since it is the brand of Ryan Seacrest, somebody has to want this thing, think this thing is going to go <laughs> higher. Uh, when I look at what they own, you know, it makes me say, boy, I, I, the more Seacrest, the better. That's what I always say. Me and me and my boy Ken Cole, Jeff, Jeff Bean, Tom, Tom Hill figure, and uh, my boy Van Heusen and my girl Olga. We're all uh, we're all friends, and I think this is uh, clearly a risk reversal and clearly bullish. Could be a stock replacement. Could be a somebody who's trying to get into the name at a, at some specific prices. So this is my old favorite strategy: the Ryan Seacrest risk reversal. That's what you're telling me. The 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 the, the, uh, the Seacrest reversal, I believe it's called. The Seacrest. <laughs> we may have a title for the show, sirs. The uh, the Ryan Seacrest risk reversal. I kind of like that. We should kind of, that sounds like a good title for a webinar. Speaking of a webinar, if you want to get some learning on, well, you don't have to go anywhere right now. We're going to dive right on into our strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the strategy block. All right, everybody. We missed him last week. He was uh, on assignment, but he's back again this week to dispense some options, wit and or wisdom. And he's promised me a double dose, a double barrel, two weeks worth to make up for last week, listeners. So that's twice the wit, twice the wisdom, twice the edumacation. Uncle Mike, that's a tall order, sir. What do you have in store for us today? I shall do my best. Okay, today I kind of want to give, I, I, not kind of, I want to give everybody an update as to what's going on with how we've been collaring things in this marketplace over the course of the last month or so. I want to go over today the knockout collar and how it can be affected in a market like we've had over the course of the last month. So I talked about this a little bit on the show in December, and there is a portion of our portfolio that we have gone with the style of collar. So let me explain to you what it is and how we came up with it. A traditional collar is when XYZ stock is trading at $50 a share. Uh, you buy the 45 put for a dollar and you sell the 55 covered call for a dollar. Uh, it's a costless collar, meaning you could make five, you could lose five or somewhere in between, multiplied by 100 shares per contract, of course. Now the knockout collar works a little bit different in that that same stock what you can do is you can also sell the 55 covered call for a dollar, let's say, and instead of buying a 45 put to where you have protection from 45 on down to zero, let's say that you could buy a 50-45 bear put spread, meaning that you have 100% protection from 50 to 45. We're assuming the expiration uh, risk graph, by the way, for now, we'll get into some uh, uh, more applicable shorter term trends in a moment. Uh, but with that, you have protection on a 10% drop in the underlying right away. You also have potential upside for a 10% gain in the underlying. So with that, there's always a pro and a con to everything. And this is assuming that the prices match up like they are in my fantasy land example, of course. But the disadvantage is if should the stock go below 45, you have absolutely no protection whatsoever. Now this year, going into our 2016 meetings, what we had decided is that we were going to use a version of the knockout collar for our hedging for both SPY and for our strategic night portfolio. So the way with which we set it up is that SPY was trading and we put the collar on on December 31st. SPY closed 2015 at 20387. We used 205 as our base number because it was around that level at one point during the day that day, the last day of 2014. And it's a nice even number that kind of worked out well for what we were trying to do. So step one of our knockout collar is that we purchased a January 2017 205 185 bear put spread now simultaneously instead of just selling a covered call 
what we chose to do was sell a bear call spread. We sell a call spread instead of just a traditional covered call. Uh, we sold the 225, 245 call spread for that same time frame. Now, the numbers with which how they all added up onto this, uh, the 225 call we sold for 423, the 245 call we ended up buying for 61 cents. So that gave us an overall cost on this of $3.62. Now, with that, we ended up getting out of the call spread when we were down probably around the 185 level a couple weeks ago, or yeah, a couple weeks ago, uh, for 90 cents. And so in some, for the strategic night, I believe we got out at 70 cents. And then for SPY, we got out at 90 cents, I believe is what it was. But anyway, what that did is that gave us $2.50 of free money, so to speak, to apply towards the cost of the put options, the put spread. Now, with that, the overall cost going into this trade, it did come out to be a debit of approximately $3 when everything was added up. And right now we're running at a debit of probably about in the high threes, low fours for the cost of this trade. Now, you might think, well, Mike, I don't want to pay a debit. I want to get my juice paid for. I'm an option block listener. Bear with me, folks. We're working on paying for the juice, but let me explain a little Mike, bit more. I don't want to. I don't want to pay for my juice. I'm an option block listener. Absolutely, and you're pro and you're also an option pit customer. You get your juice for free. So <laughs> allow me to el elaborate even more. So with that being said, uh, right now we're running at about a four dollar debit. Now let's say that we do absolutely nothing the rest of the year. Now right now my concern is getting the juice paid for. Well, the SPY, the dividend, is approximately 2% annually. The dividend will pay for your juice. So at this stage in the marketplace, we can have it set up to where we have downside protection of up to 10%, unlimited upside, and the juice paid for, assuming the dividends continue to be paid in SPY. So that's one way with which the juice is paid for. That should be the title of the show, the juice is paid for. Anyway, moving onward, Let's go through some scenarios. The real concern of this trade for me, and as it should be for anyone else putting on some type of a knockout collar, would be what do you do if the market goes down? If the market goes up, any idiot can deal with things then. But what do you do if the market goes down? Now, we originally drew our line in the sand at the 185 level as to when we would take action on this trade. Uh, and if the market were to close below 185 on SPY, uh, we were planning on rolling down the 185 put down to the 165 put. Through our calculations, at the end of last year, we assumed that would be a cost of around $7. And sure enough, that's about what the cost was had we gone ahead and did it. Uh, we never closed below 185, so we never did it. But one thing that we were noticing was that same roll down cost would be probably around $8 if we went down to the 180 level. So based on what we saw that day a couple weeks ago when we were actually below uh, the 185 level for a little bit, we decided to change our line in the sand from 185 to 180 because for an extra dollar of cost, we want that $5 worth of wiggle room in SPY. So for now, what we're doing is so long as SPY stays above the 180 level, our plan is to do absolutely nothing. Uh, we're going to do stuff by doing nothing. That could be another show title, doing stuff by doing nothing. But if we go down to that level, our plan is to roll down the put. Now, we've talked about this on the show before in terms of how it can be beneficial. Not beneficial, but it's not going to bite as badly rolling down puts as the market goes downward. There is the put skew, that the volatility skew that exists, meaning that volatility is typically higher at lower strike price puts. So because of that, rolling down puts is not necessarily the most difficult thing in the world in terms of getting a decent price for the roll down. Now, don't get me wrong, if we have another year like 2008, uh, that would be a problem, but we've estimated that we could still probably get out at approximately a 12 to 15% loss on the year, at least with SPY, if we were to have another year similar to 2008. We're okay with that. We're trying to get approximately a third of the downside, uh, but we're still trying to capture about 70% of the upside on this, and we believe that we can do this. Now, let's look at the individual legs of this trade. With this put spread, we're selling higher volatility than we're buying. Meaning when we bought the 205 put, we sold the 185 put. 
the volatility on the 185 put was, and still is for that matter, higher than the 205 put. So as an option trader looking at this, you're selling a greater amount of vol than you're buying. That's a good thing if it can still continue to give you what you're trying to accomplish. Now let's look at it on the upside. We sold a 225, 245 call spread. Instead of just doing a traditional covered call to where we're limiting upside uh, completely, we chose to just limit upside between 10 and 20%, meaning that if the market were to go up 10%, then we would get to participate on all of it, with the exception of the dividend, which we use to finance the juice. Maybe that's a show title, finance the juice. However, we were willing to give up the upside between 225 and 245. Should the market go up after 245, then we would still participate on all of it. We just would not participate between 225 and 245. We gave up between 10 and 20% approximately for our potential gain on the year to accomplish this actual trade. Now, our plan at the, in the near term is that if we do increase, we may sell the call spread again. We don't know at this point, or we may buy back the short put. Well, there's a lot of things with which we can do, but what we're looking at right now is that until SPY comes above 200 again, we're probably not going to take any action, at least on this specific trade. So with that being said, that is the way with which we are financing the juice at this point to try and pay for it. And we might get out of the trade before expiration and actually have the potential to make a profit on the hedge, have the market go up and just make everybody smile. It might not work out that way, but you never know, that's what we aim to do. And that is the strategy block for today, the first day of February, 2016. Wow, that was about a 2X strategy block. You did not lie, sir. I try not to. And you delivered multiple potential titles, too. You're, you're, coming, you're firing on all cylinders today. I'm still liking the Ryan Seacrest one. We may end up going with that, but I, I like your suggestions. Maybe we'll put those in our back pocket for another day. And we still got a few minutes here, so let's squeeze in uh, some quick listener mail with a quick mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Mail Block. You guys know the drill. Tweet at us at Options on Facebook at The Options Insider or just the stock twits were Options Insider or just questions at The Options Insider or just hit us up on the website or via the mobile app. It's all baked into there. No shortage of ways for you guys to, uh, to get at us, just like our friend here, First up, uh, Jaden, J. Don, he writes, hey, congrats on your milestone. How did you get such a cool handle? We get this question quite a bit. <laughs> I don't really tend to answer on the show, but today seemed like an appropriate day because a lot of people firing off about this. We did, of course, uh, pass the uh, 10,000 mark on Twitter today, which was fun. And people always ask us when we see that, hey, how'd you guys get such a such a cool handle at options? That's a, that's a pretty coveted handle. And we get asked that a lot, like I said. And that really kind of just stemmed from, well, first off, thanks to everybody who's out there following us on Twitter. We don't worry. We're trying to, for 2016, we're going to revamp even more what we do with Twitter. We really kind of really, it was kind of on the back burner for us for a long time, but now in 2016, we're going to make it much more of the focus of a lot of what we do. So you're going to see a lot more content coming out there. We already, already had a lot of stuff coming out there, but even more, a lot of cool stuff. So be, you'll be engaged with us throughout the day on a variety of cool stuff. If you're not following us at Options, and I'm sure a lot of you already are, then do so. It'll be, I think, worth the follow there. As for the handle, um, that thing that kind of just kind of originated from me being a little bit of a techno file and way back i think it was late 2006 right on the time we were building the first incarnation of the options inside getting ready to go live in january of 2007 i heard about this little thing a lot of people were using out there called twitter right then it was pretty much only a handful of uh, technorati and a few others and i saw little things kind of cool and as you want to do uh, you sign up for services and you grab some account names without really knowing what you're going to do with it down the road at the time i was just pretty much lazy i didn't really want to spell options insider every time i typed it out so i said i'll just get options we put that in our back pocket, and we launched in January of 07, and the rest kind of unfolded. If I had known at the time what a, what a land grab Twitter would become, I would have grabbed everything under the sun, of course. It's become essentially the de facto URL for a lot of firms. Now, they rely more on their Twitter than they do their company website. Uh, but that said, uh, yeah, at the time, it was kind of just... And even then, going in those early years, 2007, 2008, when no one knew what the hell Twitter was, and we'd be going out to meet with a potential partner or a sponsor, or I don't care, broker, exchange, whatever it was, we'd tell them all the things we were doing, and they, could, they, they got the website... They, 
maybe they probably couldn't really get the podcast either it was still pretty new back then and then twitter they had no clue what the heck we were talking about and we would usually leave those meetings and i'd get approached by let's say uh the uh, the uh, the tech guy the it guy he'd come up to me and say hey i love your twitter feed and that was the audience we were going for in the beginning it was the it was the subset of options users who were it savvy enough to know what the hell twitter was and actually use it it wasn't until 2009 2010 or so when twitter seemed to really kind of go uh, more mainstream and uh, and kind of uh, kind of really get out there in the uh, in the public in the pu- in the in the public eye uh, and become more popular and then of course from there we kind of just uh, played around with it a bit but yeah it's always been something we had in the back pocket people ask us all the time how do we get it a and b do we want to sell it the answer is usually no <laughs> we've had some interesting offers but nothing's really uh, nothing's met my level yet but if you're interested let us know uh, even though not going to sell it I'm just teasing uh, but that that said it's been a, a fun ride looking forward to a lot more I think we're going to put a lot more focus on Twitter that just seems to be where a lot of our audience is versus Facebook and the other places we'll still play there but Twitter is where a lot of you guys are really active and engaged and, and having fun there so uh, we'll keep going with all of that uh, that stuff Two saw his or you can't see it listeners he's offering a cool a, uh, a one billion in the, in the chat for uh, for the Twitter handle so Uncle Mike that check cash is you and I make talk. How about that? That a deal? That check cash is we, we could talk about handing over the ad options to you. How about that? Oh, crap. I misplaced the decimal point again. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, uh, great question. Thanks, everybody who followed us and sent such nice messages today. And don't worry, a lot more to come on the Twitter front for us here in, uh, in 2016. And now let's see. Let's, we'll keep on rolling right on into our final segment. It's time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, listeners, time for one last check-in with the big Goog, a.k.a. Alphabet, here. And they're kind of hovering about unched since the last time we checked in on the top of the show, up about 43 bucks or about 5.7% or so. So they seemed haven't really budged that much since the last time we checked in with them. Of course, we are in the teeth of earnings season, listener. Tomorrow, formerly known as the Stealth Apple, now it is the well-known Salmonella source, a.k.a. Chipotle, reporting after the bell tomorrow. CMG also got Exxon, some other names out there in the old uh, petroleum land, as well as Merck. Yahoo, good old Yahoo, cause of a lot of speculation out coming out tomorrow as well. Wednesday, in our neck of the woods, SIBO. We were just talking about them. They're coming out on, I usually think they're before the bell. Uh, then GM and the much maligned GoPro on Wednesday and Thursday. More exchanges, ICE, I-C-E, coming out before the bell as well. And LinkedIn coming out after. And then Friday, wrapping up exchange week here with CME Group. So if you're active on that front, a lot of uh, a lot of exchange names for you guys to watch this week. That said, Uncle Mike, what else is catching your eye for the week to come? Of course, I should have mentioned we do have uh, the big number at the end of the week as well. Aside from that stuff, what's catching your eye this week, sir? I mean, this is a very data-heavy week with between earnings, between non-farm. I believe it's something like 200 of the 500 S and P 500 companies are reporting this week, so we're going to get some movement this week, most likely. I would think. Uh, aside from that. Uh, we just need to uh, focus in on that game that they're playing this coming Sunday. Um, that uh, that quarterback guy, Peyton, I think his name is, and see if he can win another one. Too bad for your much beloved Bills. Ah, uh, wait till next year. Them and the Cubs <laughs> both. Yet, yet another rebuilding year. <laughs> hey, you know they they have the Mike Tussaw curse. Ever since they cut me, they have not made the su- the playoffs. You know that, right? That's true. They were quite the dynasty. When I was growing up, they would clobber the Pats every year, uh, and now not so much. Kind of the other way around. <laughs> they were a perennial playoff team, and then when they cut me, they haven't made the playoffs since. There you go. The Tucson curse. So there you go, listeners. Don't hire him and fire him because it'll come back to, to haunt you in that little voodoo idol he puts in your back pocket as he leaves. All right. Speaking of voodoo idols, this guy's been known to have a few of them. Mr. Greasy Meatball, what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of this week? You know, just keeping an eye out on uh... – on everything that's going on out there and uh, earnings, you name it. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we've got a real a real interesting week ahead of us. Uh, we have the Chinese New Year starting next week. So if, if, chi- if, chi- if there is a week where things might be a little slow, maybe this is the week. Uh, who knows? But uh, it's interesting, interesting that uh, Apple's now the number two company in the world. Software versus hardware, sir. Software taking the day. We'll see if uh, if that can change, or perhaps who knows. Uncle Mike's uh, much anticipated iCar 
could be the thing to uh to oh yeah back just like the, the watch did right <laughs> or, i'm wait, sorry is it, until they come up with something that isn't ugly they're gonna have problems oh, wait is it gonna be the tv that's gonna do it what's gonna do it oh yeah well and and the funny thing is everybody just ripped on microsoft the surface actually had more revenue than ipad last quarter I've heard a lot of good things. I, I mean, every time I anecdotally run into someone who has a Surface, they're they love it. They're effusive with their praise of it, and then I don't I don't ask them. They just hey, you should check this thing out. I, you don't see that as much, maybe because the iPad's kind of uh, the old school thing now. But yeah, yeah. Everyone and their mother seems to love a Surface that has them. So from my own anecdotal experience, that certainly seems to be the case. Uh, interesting stuff afoot all week here this week, and that's going to do it for another episode of this here program, the old Option Block. But before we go, as always, let me check back in with each of my cohorts one last time here on the old All-Star panel. See what they have cooking that may interest you. Starting in the land of scenic St. Charles, Uncle Mike Tussaud, what's cooking in the land of going long? Buy my book. Send me an email. Call me. Uh, my book's available, Go Long, New Option Strategies for Buy and Hold Investors on Amazon, second edition. We are excited about the new chapters on both portfolio margin and weekly options. They come out with dailies, I'll have to write a third edition. Uh, and if you are have any questions on portfolio management or anything along those lines, feel free to give me a call at 312-212-3531 or send me an email at m2saw at rcmfs.com. There you go, listeners. He just wants your love. Give the man some love. Reach out to him. Have a talk. He wants just just chat with you in the middle of the day. It'll make his day go that much faster. And of course, pick up the old book. Two bucks, two ninety nine, whatever. It's you, you can swing it. Skip the coffee. Grab. Go long. I think you'll be better served by that trade. All right. And last but not least, Mister Greasy Meatball. What's cooking in the land of the pit as well as Carmen Line? Uh, I think the big piece is if you go to uh, our Option Pit events page, our beginner boot camp is now available. Uh, just go to optionpit.com slash events. You can register right there. Uh, use code 25 underscore off to take an extra 25 bucks off for Option Insider listeners. It's going to be a great camp. End of the month this month. There you go, listeners. Surf on over. Don't forget to use the code 25 underscore off. Save some money. Make all this time listening to the old option block pay off, not just in your trading, but in your education. Of course, while you're there, take three of those bucks that you saved, buy Uncle Mike's book, and then you're winning and you're winning. There you go. Two. Sebastian just paid for your Uncle Mike book. There you go. Done and done. Everyone's a happy camper. And on behalf of the Greasy Meatball and Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing. And of course, thank all of you guys who've been following us, pushing us over that mystical number of 10,000. There's a lot more to come, so don't worry. Stay following us on the Twitter front. And we'll, of course, see you next time for more here on the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 